In this edition of our cinematic investigation, we're putting on our tinfoil hats and delving into the burning question, how did the first kaiju make its grand entrance onto our humble planet? And perhaps more mind-bogglingly, how in the name of Holy Godzilla did these colossal beasts come into existence? But that's not all. We'd also be exploring their creators, called precursors, and the realm they live in. So, strap yourselves in for a wild ride as we dive deep into the mysterious origins of those colossal creatures that rock the world in Pacific Rim. Let's begin. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. What's their origin? Where do they come from? To sum it up, kaiju are essentially monsters sent to Earth by an ancient and technologically super advanced race of aliens called the Precursors, who wanted to colonize Earth. The Precursors, an extraterrestrial species hailing from the Antiverse, are a formidable race of colonizers responsible for the creation of the kaiju. The Precursors themselves manifest as spindly entities towering over 12 feet in height and possessing an astonishing life lifespan, spanning millions of years, possessing an intriguing appearance reminiscent of aquatic insects. They don translucent wings and exhibit shell-like bodies, offering tantalizing glimpses into their enigmatic internal systems. Elongated, crest-like heads and graceful heel protrusions accentuate their alien visage, while their small opal eyes bear an uncanny resemblance to the piercing gaze of a shark. Operating within a hierarchical structure reminiscent of pre-revolutionary French nobility. The precursors hold titles such as cardinal, bishop, and ambassador, donating their appearance and position in their society. These ranks are beautifully embodied in the design of their wide and flat crowns, showcasing their affinity for fashion and culture. Biomechanical implements play a vital role in precursor civilization, and they inhabit colossal, towering formations that seamlessly blend with their environment. In their ancient history, the precursors initially attempted to colonize Earth during the era of the dinosaurs. However, they found the environment unsuitable for their survival because it was way too clean and natural. However, millions of years later, with the gradual pollution of the planet by humankind, conditions became favorable for their return and colonization because by now, humanity had practically terraformed the Earth by polluting it. To counter the growing threat of human existence, the precursors engineered the kaiju. These kaiju, later dubbed by humans as such, made their menacing debut in San Francisco on August 10, 2013. Thus, the stage was set as the precursors with their calculated plan and awe-inspiring abilities utilized the kaiju to unleash devastation upon humanity. But who was the first kaiju? How did the first kaiju land on Earth? Although the first kaiju's appearance on Earth was never shown in the films, its story was detailed in the comic titled Pacific Rims – Tales from Year Zero. The self-explanatory title of the comic is enough to understand that we are taken back to the year 2013 when the breach first came into existence and the kaiju threat made itself known to mankind. So, let's cut to the chase. In the opening scene of the comic, we find journalist Naomi Sokolov paying a visit to the Anchorage Shadow Dome with the intention of interviewing the esteemed Pan-Pacific Defense Corps Marshal, Stacker Pentecost. Yeah, the character played by Idris Elba. However, her arrival coincides with the ongoing repairs of the renowned Jaeger Gypsy Danger. As she enters the restricted area, she encounters the lively Tendo Choi, the Shadow Dome technician played by Clifton Collins Jr. Tendo greets her with a playful remark about her unauthorized presence. After exchanging introductions, Tendo graciously apologizes on behalf of Stacker, who appears to be in Hawaii attending to personal matters. It seems Stacker had intended to intercept Naomi and inform her about his unavailability before she ventured into the Shadow Dome. While Naomi observes Gypsy Danger in its state of repair, she brings up the closures of other Shadow Domes in conversation. Tendo asks if her piece was regarding the said closures and the transfer of the Shadow Dome funds to the anti-kaiju wall. However, to Naomi's chagrin, she confesses that her assigned task is to write a cheerful retrospective piece emphasizing humanity's indomitable spirit in the face of kaiju threats. Though somewhat disappointed by Naomi's change of topic, Tendo, being the amiable soul that he is, agrees to grant her an interview. With a reflective tone, he delves into his own experience during the infamous K-Day, or the Kaiju Day, when the first kaiju named Trespasser appeared in San Francisco. He reveals that he was once a humble ferry worker, whose life changed on K-Day. In the midst of chaos, 
Tendo found himself faced with a critical decision when the first kaiju trespasser unleashed its devastating attack. While diligently assisting civilians onto the safety of their boat, Tendo realized that his grandfather was alone and needed to be helped immediately. He dashed off to Chinatown with the intention of saving his beloved grandfather, known as Ye Ye. Despite the numerous obstacles and even the valiant efforts of fighter pilots attempting to eliminate the trespasser, Tendo managed to successfully retrieve Ye Ye, and the duo made their way back to the ferry just in the nick of time. Meanwhile, as the world grappled with the unfolding catastrophe, the events sparked various reactions from different individuals. Young Raleigh and Yancey Beckett, captivated by the unfolding spectacle, glued themselves to the television screens, witnessing the terrifying monster's rampage. Across town, a young Mako Mori caught wind of the unfolding chaos through a crackling radio transmission, her ears absorbing the distressing reports. Simultaneously, Stacker Pentecost engaged in a heartfelt conversation with his sister, Luna, amidst the bustling streets of London. The news of the monstrous attack weighed heavily upon them, prompting Luna to disclose a remarkable revelation. Luna revealed that her supposedly leisurely holiday had served as a clever guise, affording her the opportunity to clandestinely train on advanced fighter jets at the Vandenberg Air Force Base. Far from being recruited into this mission, Luna and their mutual friend Tamsin Sevier had wholeheartedly volunteered their services to aid the American forces. Stacker, filled with a mix of concern and understanding inquired about her motives. Luna swiftly reminded him of the deep-rooted alliance between the United Kingdom and the United States during the dark days of World War II. Knowing his sister's spirit all too well, Stacker recognized her yearning for the opportunity to slay a dragon, a chance to face an extraordinary adversary head-on. Luna and her trusted comrade Tamsin embarked on their mission to San Francisco, joining forces with the U.S. Air Force and their squadron. Despite the relentless onslaught of fighter jets and their valuable valiant efforts to subdue the monstrous trespasser. Their collective might barely managed to halt the creature's destructive path. Luna, driven by a daring idea, aimed to deliver a decisive blow by launching a sidewinder missile directly into the trespasser's gaping maw. However, in the heat of the moment, she unwittingly neglected Tamsin's urgent warnings. Tragically, trespasser smashed Luna's jet in two and claimed her life in the process. Meanwhile, Tendo's heart-wrenching journey unfolded in parallel, discovering that Ye Ye had become unwittingly drenched in kaiju blood. During the chaos caused by the fighter jet's assault, Tendo was confronted with the sight of his grandfather's imminent demise. Ye Ye, alas, succumbed to his wounds, just as the trespasser met its cataclysmic end through the detonation of a nuclear bomb. In the aftermath of the trespasser's devastating rampage in San Francisco, obtaining concrete factual information about the creature proved to be quite the challenge. Towering over the Golden Gate Bridge, or at least reaching its impressive height, trespasser possessed the strength to effortlessly dismantle the iconic structure using its formidable claws. Its skin, boasting impressive thickness, served as a robust defense against virtually all conventional weaponry. Notably, Trespasser exhibited an intriguing bioluminescent orange glow emanating from its mouth, adding an eerie touch to its already fearsome appearance. Much like its counterparts, Slattern, Knifehead, and Scunner, Trespasser's primary arms consisted of two fused limbs, culminating in three clawed digits. Following its demise, the military promptly gathered the remains of Trespasser, even putting its skull on public display, a macabre spectacle indeed. While the general public viewed Trespasser's attack as an exceptional occurrence, an anomaly of sorts, fate had other plans. Merely six months later, a second colossal kaiju emerged in Manila, signaling that the threat was far from contained. It is worth noting that, due to Trespasser's assault predating the establishment of the Pan-Pacific Defense Corps, the Corps faced a significant challenge in categorizing the creature. Even with the creation of the Serizawa scale, discerning Trespasser's category class from its lifeless form proved to be an insurmountable task. How were they created? The crazy creation of these colossal beings begins with the intricate design at the hands of the precursors, who cloned the kaijus from a single strand of DNA of an unknown organism. Despite sharing an identical genetic makeup, the kaiju exhibit a mesmerizing array of phenotypes, resulting in a vast spectrum of anatomical diversity. Thus, while echoes of their cloning origins persist, each individual kaiju emerges as a unique specimen, exquisitely distinct from its brethren, boasting an array of captivating forms and characteristics. Originally conceived as ruthless champions of melee combat, these chosen creations engage in brutal confrontations, vying for survival in a test of supremacy. Those who emerge victorious ascend to their destined role as formidable biological weapons, instruments wielded by the precursors, our alien colonists. 
to eradicate existing life forms and pave way for colonization upon a chosen planet. Within this epic evolution, the kaiju undergo a metamorphosis, each iteration surpassing its predecessor in both size and power. Magnificent specimens such as Otachi and Leatherback exemplify this progress, bearing witness to the emergence of unparalleled biological armament, boasting not only sheer size, strength, and formidable claws and teeth, but also an array of unique and awe-inspiring biological weaponry, including the potent discharge of acid and electromagnetic forces. While the physical integrity of these colossal creatures may succumb to the ravages of time, the swift intervention of kaiju organ harvesters ensures that no fragment is wasted. These individuals capitalize on the ephemeral nature of kaiju remains, swiftly gathering the precious spoils to satisfy their insatiable market demands. Kaiju Anatomy Explored Let's begin with their blood and interior physiology. These beasts are so huge and so different from each other that it is difficult to find parameters that could be used to group them into categories. So the scientists came up with the Serizawa scale to classify them, which precisely gauges their power through water displacement, toxicity, and ambient radiation emitted during their passage through the breach. The scale delineates them into five distinct categories, with the feeblest falling under category 1 and 2. And yet uber huge and strong, while the full force of their might is unleashed in categories 3 through 5. Apart from their enormous size, the one thing that separates them from other monsters is their immense toxicity. When they meet their demise in battle, a self-destruct mechanism is triggered, resulting in an immediate annihilation. Their disintegrating bodies release their blood, which is a noxious ammonia-based agent, also known as kaiju blue. It contaminates the air and the immediate vicinity, rendering it uninhabitable. The acidic nature nature of the blood poses challenges in safely extracting samples for examination and experimentation. Consequently, Jaegers are equipped with weaponry that cauterizes the wounds inflicted on kaiju, preventing the dissemination of their highly corrosive internal fluids. As far as their exterior physiology is concerned, the kaiju manifest an awe-inspiring stature, and even the smallest of the adults reach hundreds of feet in height and weigh thousands of tons. In fact, a baby kaiju is equivalent to two African elephants. To govern their immense physicality, these titans boast not one, but two brains, orchestrating both their motive functions and and cognitive faculties. Remarkably, bipedal kaiju often exhibit multiple arms, typically boosted with two primary appendages and a secondary pair, evoking a visual semblance of dual forelimbs through a unique arrangement of ulna and humerus bones. Their formidable physiques bestow upon them an unparalleled adaptability, enabling them to reign supreme over both terrestrial and aquatic realms once they traverse the threshold into our world through the breach. Unbound by environmental constraints, kaiju defy convention by thriving in diverse habitats, ranging from terrestrial landscapes to the seclusion of subterranean chambers, braving extreme heat and oppressive pressures. They navigate the depths of the ocean with ease and remarkably endure in airless voids. Interestingly, kaiju are symbiotic in nature, harboring many parasites that symbiotically coexist with the kaiju. What's their purpose? In the grand tapestry of cinematic marvels, few spectacles have captured the imagination quite like the explosive extravaganza that is Pacific Rim, or this can at least be said for the first movie, if not the sequel. This titanic tale of gargantuan monsters and their ceaseless onslaught upon humanity has left many an eager viewer spellbound, pondering the deeper mysteries lurking beneath the surface. But there were a lot of loopholes in the plan of the precursors to send the kaijus to destroy humans across the globe. For instance, all the kaiju came out from one specific point, and it meant that they would quite literally have to travel to the various far-off parts of the world on foot or by swimming. Furthermore, for all their size and strength, they are exceptionally terrible at killing humans. I mean, that one bomb during the Second World War killed more humans than a kaiju attack that lasted for days. Speaking of the Second World War, did you check out the trailer for Oppenheimer? Anyway, these fallacies in the precursor plan beg that there must be another purpose that the kaiju were supposed to serve. So, let us delve into into the depths of speculation and understand the true purpose of these colossal creatures. As the film unravels, we are introduced to a world in crisis, where nations once divided have cast aside their animosities to forge a united front against the fearsome kaiju. Admirable as this newfound unity may be, we cannot ignore the stubborn truth that humans, being creatures of passion and strife, do not readily relinquish their grudges and grievances. Consider, if you will, the audacity of a plan that seeks
seeks not to annihilate mankind outright, but rather to instigate a cataclysm of our own making. The kaiju were not simply unleashed to trample the globe like lumbering behemoths on a world tour. No, their purpose was far more insidious and cunning. The precursors, or otherworldly architects of chaos, knew all too well the relentless yearning for power that courses through the veins of our species. As humanity rallied in a desperate bid for survival, channeling their collective resources and innovation into the relentless pursuit of kaiju-slaying weapons, the true intentions of these creatures slowly unraveled. The colonists, as we aptly dubbed them, sought not to decimate us directly, but rather to catalyze our growth as a race, albeit in the most abhorrent and myopic of ways. As our focus shifted to the grim art of combat, fueled by a desire to preserve our existence, our cultural, social, and political advancement languished in the shadow of the kaiju menace. The colonists, it seems, were banking on our unwavering propensity for conflict by goading us into a rapid evolution of our killing capabilities. They laid the groundwork for an inevitable climax of devastation. For when the kaiju threat would ultimately be vanquished, a world armed to the teeth with devastating weaponry would be left in its wake. The lingering vestiges of peace, born of necessity, would crumble beneath the weight of newfound power and greed for land and wealth. Nations once bound by fragile alliances would turn on each other, unleashing mass casualties and unfathomable chaos. But let us not forget the dark whimsy that lies beneath this intricate web of manipulation. The precursors, in all their extraterrestrial wisdom, surely did not anticipate the fervor with which humanity would fight back and effectively close the breach. Having said that, no one can say how many other rifts may lie dormant, biding their time until the right moment. How do they reproduce? According to the information provided in the movie, the DNA of all kaiju is identical, suggesting that they are being cloned. The precursors are depicted as skilled geneticists, capable of designing and manipulating DNA to create clones that fulfill their assigned purposes. However, there is one instance that seems to contradict the notion of purely cloned kaiju. The pregnancy of Otachi, Newt, a biologist who drifts with the kaiju brain, shares his knowledge and understanding of the human reproductive system with the hive mind of the kaiju. This implies that the precursors, recognizing the benefits of kaiju capable of cloning themselves, engineered Otachi with a womb capable of asexual reproduction. It turns out that the information was collected from Newt's brain. I mean, he knew all about asexual reproduction and the benefits of natural reproduction. The presence of a pregnant Otachi suggests that the overlords saw advantages in allowing certain kaiju to reproduce asexually after going through the drift. By incorporating this characteristic, the precursors ensure the production of offspring with the same same genetic traits and assigned purposes as their parent kaiju. This concept of incorporating characteristics from conquered species also explains the variety of distinct attributes observed in different kaiju. As kaiju themselves cannot evolve or undergo natural selection, the overlords may have chosen to clone other evolved creatures to introduce diversity and enhance the efficiency of their kaiju creations. Additionally, there's another theory that suggests that kaiju can choose which genes to activate and which to keep dormant. While the movie does not explicitly explain the genetic mechanisms behind the variations in appearance and abilities among the kaiju. The idea of genes being turned on and off, leading to different biological makeups, could provide a possible explanation. If we consider the concept of epigenetics, which involves changes in gene expression without altering the underlying DNA sequence, it is possible that the kaiju possesses genes that can be regulated or modified based on certain factors. These factors could include diet, environmental conditions, or intentional genetic engineering by the kaiju overlords. By selectively activating or deactivating specific blocks of their genome, the kaiju could exhibit distinct physical characteristics and develop unique abilities suited to their assigned purposes. This would allow for the diversity observed among the kaiju despite their identical DNA. Will the kaiju return? What would be their powers? What the exact fate of the breach and the potential return of the kaiju is not explored in the sequel to Pacific Rim. It is indeed plausible to consider the possibility that the breach may not have closed for good. One theory suggests that the kaiju may be biding their time, waiting for an opportune moment to reopen the breach and launch a second wave of attacks. It is conceivable that humans drifting with the kaiju has allowed the creatures behind the breach to become aware of humanity's plans and their current circumstances. This newfound knowledge could potentially influence their strategies and decision-making regarding when and how to strike again. Furthermore, with the destruction of the last Jaeger and the temporary defenselessness of the human race, it could be seen as an advantageous moment for the kaiju to plan their return without any immediate means of defense. 
humanity would be vulnerable to another assault from the kaiju. Having said that, the fate of the breach and the potential resurgence of the kaiju are left open-ended, allowing for different interpretations and theories to emerge among fans of the franchise. Since you've reached this point of the video, I'm assuming that you are a fan of the Pacific Rim franchise, and I think it would be wise to suggest our video on literally all the Jaegers from the franchise. I'll leave a link in the description. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.